Hi everybody. It's about that time yet again. Um, I'm going to try to record lectures in general, but um, don't rely on them because there's always some some technical problem or other that makes it so that they're less than perfect, but I'm just going to go for it anyway, see what happens. Uh, today, well, those who were here last week, um, but not everyone was. Uh, have you should try to get the the book if you haven't yet try to get the book landscapes of minnesota we have two other books but we're not gonna be doing stuff with them until the second half of the semester um but they should all be at the bookstore <clears throat> um and now that you've had a chance to kind of get into the writings a little bit kind of see the shape of the book and um it's not too complicated in my opinion of a textbook it's pretty straightforward, um, which is a benefit to students, of course. Um, we watched a, a video last week talking about basically going back in time, talking about the natural environment, what makes Minnesota what it is, and that's something that we're going to be going over today. Um, my plan today is to cover chapters one and two. Uh, they're pretty quick. Uh, and then I'll have you do some of those in-class questions that I've talked about I would be having you do. Um, all right, so geography, right? The field of geography, which is what this class is a, is a part of. Um, geography is a very kind of big picture, right? It tries to look at, even if we look at something very focused like Minnesota, we're still looking at big picture things. Um, geography has a ton of different things in it, and we will talk about all these different things, the different extents, things from a range of climate to biogeography, soils, to political geography, cultural, historical, obviously a lot of that in here, um, economic geography. Uh, we're going to be kind of covering everything, but just focused on Minnesota. Uh, so this is kind of an all-around geography class compared to most other geography classes. Those of you who have taken a geography, you probably took a physical, you know, or you took a human, or maybe a world. Um, they usually don't. Don't try to include everything uh, like they do uh, for, for a Minnesota class. So we're going to look at lots of different maps throughout the class, lots of maps kind of giving us insights into what makes us culturally distinctive and where we are. So we should have both doors popped open. No, I was going to be you could probably put that in the door. So it's a little bit open, but it's not so down. A jar. <clears throat> um, so little things like a map of, you know, what areas of the U.S. are mostly heating, which are mostly cooling. You can kind of see similarities and start to kind of categorize in your head. A uh, number of the concepts we're going to talk about in the first chapter Continentality. Continentality comes up a lot. I don't know if people have had physical geography. They've heard the term continentality before. Is anyone not? Or really? Um, well, it's a pretty simple concept. Uh, continentality just means that land heats up more quickly than water. Right? Very simple rule, but that one simple rule. Uh, shapes the weather in lots of different places, lots of different places. Um, so for example, areas around the Great Lakes, uh, well, their temperatures will be, they'll have less highs and lows compared to places that are a little further out uh, because bodies of water take more time to heat up uh, and so, and also cool off. Right, so they're kind of a regulating mechanism. Um, so where do we get our heat from? Right, insulation, incoming solar radiation. That's what the term insulation means. He throws in a lot of these terms that maybe you have to look at at the time you're going through them. Uh, incoming solar radiation just means the heat coming from the sun, right? <clears throat> um, in general, in general, uh, 
where the sun's rays are coming in at a straight angle, those are places that will get heated up more quickly, right? Places where the same amount of sun rays are split off over a larger geographic area, well, it's the same amount of heat, but covering a larger area, right? So it's, uh, I mean, a lot of stuff is pretty basic stuff that you guys probably had in elementary school, but the book talks about it. So, um, so in general, places around the equator tend to be warmer than places around the poles. And obviously there's seasonal change about that as well, right? <clears throat> um, the book also talks about uh, wavelengths of solar radiation, right? Wavelengths. What does that mean? Well, um, incoming solar radiation, uh, short wave radiation, short wave radiation, right? Um, when that radiation comes in and it bounces off of something, be it the land, be it yourself, be it whatever it is, when it bounces off, it's long wave radiation. And why does that matter? Well, things like uh, carbon dioxide, right? Things that we call um, greenhouse gases, right? That make the earth warm. Uh, well, that's because the long wave radiation can't quite go back through it the way short wave radiation can, right? So the earth heats up. And in general, this is obviously a good thing because we don't want every night when the sun goes down for it to be 200 degrees below zero, right? We want animo to that warmth to stay uh, keeping us warm. Um, this chapter talks about urban heat island, urban heat island. What that means is, uh, well, similar to your car when it's parked on a warm day, um, you know, you have shortwave radiation coming in, goes through your windshield really easily, right? If you're sitting in your car and you're feeling the sun come in, you could feel that heat coming in. Um, then once it bounces off of your car seats and whatever is in your car, it's long wave radiation. Uh, that long wave radiation doesn't go through the windows as easily, so it will just kind of bounce around in your car and accumulate. And that's why, you know, after you go to the fair and you go back to your car at the end of the day, it's like roasting hot, right? It's like, well, why is it so hot? Well, it's been, heat has been coming in and not allowed to go out. Um, urban heat island effect is kind of like a large version of this. If you look at, uh, well, most cities, right? Uh, and it depends on where you go. Um, I was just in, uh, uh, Florence, Italy this last summer and the city itself had very little green space and the pavement was all dark which absorbs heat and so there was already uh, a great big heat wave going on there um, but all that um, urban infrastructure usually is not built in a way to dissipate heat especially in Europe uh, but in Minnesota as well we don't work extra hard at kind of dissipating the heat that happens but it's still a factor. T typically what that means is uh, places that are closer, more urbanized will be warmer than when you move out mm -hmm. to places that are, that are less urbanized. <clears throat> uh, as I said, we're gonna be looking at a lot of different maps in this class. Um, usually college textbooks, they'll send you a thing with with uh, slides for all the pictures they use, so you could use them in your PowerPoints. But not these guys, no. Mm -hmm. uh, so sometimes I will just take pictures from my phone and put them in lectures. So if the pictures look, this isn't one of them, this is just one I got from somewhere else. But just FYI, the picture quality will, will vary. Um, this here is an example of, well, how you can have a map of one thing, but it could actually give you data on lots of different things. Mm -hmm. What I mean about that is, uh, well, this is a map of um, lights at night, lights at night, right? Uh, it's a pretty simple thing, but I'm sure that if you looked at this, you might be able to eyeball where the Twin Cities are, right? You might be able to figure that out. Mm -hmm. uh, what's this, anyone know? Chicago. Oh, Chicago. Uh, Twin Cities here, um, and so although this is a map of lights, 
you could actually get a pretty good idea about how the Twin Cities are kind of the major urban area <coughs> for a good distance around us, right? That's one of the reasons why very often people refer to going to the cities uh, if they're from out of state, right? I mean, they're coming to the Twin Cities. Uh, and the Twin Cities has been that way, that kind of central urban hub for a large area uh, for most of its existence. Most of its existence. Um, I would say the other thing you could kind of see on this map, you could see other urban locations by their light. Uh, I think you could even kind of see major roadways, right? There's little lines here and there. Uh, just some things you can see from a map. <clears throat> uh, so I was mentioning urban heat island. Um, this is a, a thermal image looking at, well, you could see um, pavement, right? Uh, really, really soaking up a lot of heat and it soaks it up and then it radiates it out uh, so that you kind of can't escape the warmth. Uh, the further you go this way, the more it gets into green and natural environments. Um, the less urban infrastructure there is and the more kind of natural environments, the more those are able to um, regulate temperature changes, right? Because we have lots of, lots of organisms, plants and animals and whatnot, that they have evolved to do that. And in our urban landscapes, we're just making these kind of heat zones. <clears throat> um, another thing that this chapter talks about quite a bit uh, is the mid-Atlantic cyclone that kind of affects our weather here. You'll have this kind of twisting pattern basically right over where we are uh, happening, all, happening a lot. Um, in general, what's happening is the sun is coming in, right? Heats up land more quickly than it heats up water. So since this air here is rising because it's being heated up, right? It pulls in air masses from all over, right? So we kind of have this constant swirling that's happening where we are. Um, another thing that isn't completely unique to Minnesota, but happens a lot in Minnesota because we have so many lakes, that same continentality thing that explains weather in continents, it explains weather in smaller locations as well. Uh, so for example, during the day, you got the sun coming in, right? Land always heats up more quickly than water. Well, because that's heating up, the air rises, right? Um, and it will actually pull in the air from the body of water that is cooler. So if you're walking around the lake in the summer and you're noticing that like there's a real good constant breeze, that's part of the reason why. Um, and then at night, when it cools off, well, the water takes longer again to, to cool off, uh, but the land will cool off quick. So you have the opposite happen. You could have the wind going the opposite way. But this is all also why populations that tend to be on uh, around a lake, and the bigger the body of water that is, the more the effect. So people who live around oceans, very often their temperatures are much more evened out throughout the year. They don't have so many extremes. Um, this is a bit of a complicated map, but this is just, again, talking about continentality and showing you that um, most of our air uh, comes from the north, comes from the north, uh, which means that it uh, tends to be dry, right? Air that comes from the oceans tends to be more humid. Um, and because we get that kind of twisting system that happens as well as, uh, well, we, that's why we, we get these systems all churning up kind of right where we exist uh, here in Minnesota. Um, also, the polar jet stream uh, has been in the news a lot lately, especially when we were having some major cold weather events. Um, Trying to remember, wasn't there a phrase for it? The polar something? Vortex. vortex. Oh yeah, polar vortex, thank you. Um, well, what that means is these are, these are usually stable uh, temperature lines 
uh, that have some amount of wobble. And what's happened the past kind of, you know, a few different winters is this has dipped down lower than normal for a longer than the normal amount of time, meaning uh, really made this area as cold as places much, much more polar than, than our temperature usually is. Um, I talked about that twisting motion in the center of the continent. That is what makes, if you're ever watching like weather uh, on the late night news and you're seeing these different things and how does that happen? Well, that churning is always happening and creating high and low pressure zones. Um, very, very central to where we are is where that uh, is going on. Um, you can see why this would cause temporary, very cold weather events. Uh, this is just another graphic representation of how our cold air and warm air meets. Um, this chapter also talked about tornadoes quite a bit. Um, and I have a little video on tornadoes we might watch next week. We'll see how our, our timing uh, goes. Um, these aren't the best, best pictures of tornadoes, but has anyone seen a tornado in, in person? Yeah. Funnel cloud. Funnel cloud? Was it recent? Uh, yes, actually. I think there was one right. I was working outside the garden center and I saw one kind of developing right over top of me. Where did you see yours? Oh, that's 2008 Google Tornado. I didn't see one in the 90s. Uh, all right. I saw one in the 90s. Uh, I was, was driving back from Duluth. I actually don't remember what town it was in. Uh, but I saw it in the distance in my, in my uh, rear mirror. Uh, and the other people in my car wouldn't believe me and just kind of look around and look. But they eventually looked. and. Since it was behind us, there wasn't anything really for us to do besides just keep kind of going where we were going. Um, well, tornadoes, although they're very violent, they tend to be very short-lived, very short-lived. That's one of the reasons why maybe all you'll see is a funnel cloud, right? Because uh, that will take a few seconds longer. All right, so back to the maps. Um, you know, as you can see, we are not kind of the capital of the tornadoes. We get more than plenty of other areas of the country. Uh, but if you really wanted to see, for sure, be a storm chaser, see some more tornadoes, uh, you move to the south a little bit. Oh, I didn't know actually the Chicago area had so many. Um, don't feel like I see that in the news too much. Um, What's that? Or I didn't know that either. Hmm. Oh, Central Florida's really flat, too. Yeah, I think that's one of the big things going on with lots of these areas. Um, well, this this that, that we're kind of at the top of, this is referred to as Tornado Alley, if you ever hear that term. Uh, sometimes when people put it on maps on TV, sometimes they'll include us and sometimes they won't. Kind of depends on what they're they're going for in their news story. Um, and there is a seasonality to this type of thing because that that weather churning that I showed you a couple different pictures of, well that that moves with the seasons a bit, right? So my guess would be the ones that we saw in Florida happen happen just this time of year. Um, average number of snow days. Uh, chapter one also talked a bit about lake effect snow, um, and I think you could kind of see a, a fair amount of snow that is centered around the Great Lakes here, uh, that will tend to get more snow in places that are further out. Obviously these ones are mountain based. Um, in general, what you need to have snow is, well, a lot of the air that we get is from the north and is thus dry because it's from over land, right? Uh, but the air that is around here will have a substantial amount of moisture in it, enough to create a bit more, a bit more snow than would otherwise, uh, than you'd otherwise have. These areas, um, well, they're mountains. Um, if you take a, a, a weather or, or an air mass that has an amount of moisture 
and you push it up, like if it hits a mountain and it goes up the mountain, uh, it'll squeeze the rain out. Um, but also if it just goes up just because of the, the heat of the day, that will also cause some precipitation. Uh, let's see anything else of a note. Uh, this map talks a bit about, well actually, there's, there's like several maps in our book looking at precipitation in the state. Uh, I was just going to point out that it tends to be drier, as you can see in this corner of the state, um, but not hugely so. Uh, like I said, the book talks about a lot of things that I'm sure you've covered in, in earlier in school. For example, the, the leaves turning color, right, because it's a chlorophyll, uh, isn't present in leaves anymore seasonally. Um, oh, and this uh, chapter also talked a, a fair bit about um, erosion that happens in river systems. Uh, and I actually think our, our video talked a lot about this. Um, but falls, uh, um, I think I got some better pictures later on actually. Well, let me just say real quick. Um, you know, if you, if you go out to Minnehaha Falls or some other falls uh, and you look at it, sometimes it'll, it'll feel like it's something that, that has existed the way it looks from the dawn of time. Uh, but this is, these erode this rock face. And well, when water is moving, it has kinetic energy, right? It has energy uh, and so it grabs things, you know? You could use a high power water spray to clean something. Um, well, it grabs bits of this rock that it's falling off of because this is an amount of force here. So little tiny bits of rocks are continuously kind of being pulled out. And so falls are usually moving backward just at a very slow rate, at a very slow rate. Um, the ones that we have at St. Anthony Falls, because they're such a big part of our uh, urban power source, especially in the early days, we put up reinforced concrete and whatnot so that it wouldn't keep on moving. Plus there was the time that uh, it all exploded and there was that cave in, if you remember from the video. Um, so we wanted that to be stable, right? That's one of the reasons why a lot of cities uh, well, cities will have major river systems going through them, as we do. We have a couple different major rivers coming through us. Uh, but because rivers are an ephemeral moving thing, we try to put in the infrastructure as much as possible to, to keep it locked in place. All right, moving on to chapter two. Uh, um, you know, again, another topic, maybe you learned about this in school before now, but uh, the book wants to make sure that you're aware that, you know, glaciers shaped a fair amount of our landscape in this state. Uh, glaciers shape landscapes in many different places, uh, but it's part of the reason why, while well, the Great Lakes are where they are, the reason uh, we have soils the way that we do have soils. Um, I'll go into more specifics. Uh, as we go. Uh, Minnesota has very good soils in general. I think that was one of the big things that they talked about in the videos that I showed you. And soils, uh, good soils, take a long time. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why when we look at where the glaciers were and where they weren't in the state, areas that didn't have glaciers on them but had big meltwaters, those are areas that you had little amounts of soil um, depositing and you had microorganisms and you had lots of things that were able to kind of, let's say, process that soil uh, to step up its quality. Um, and like I said, it's a, it's a long process involving uh, water going through the soil, um, organisms interacting with it, right? all kinds of things going on that takes just a large amount of time. Can't, can't produce good soils uh, at the snap of a fingers. <clears throat> um, and typically it's the, the really uh, black soil that tends to be the, the most productive. Um, the soils that we actually have here in Minnesota 
Uh, like I've, I've traveled to many areas of the world. Uh, in Egypt, part of the reasons one of the colors on their flag is black is because black soil is, is better than gold. Well, in, in Egypt it was rare because it was only along the Nile. Um, so you can imagine when uh, the first Europeans came in and they were doing soil surveys and kind of checking out resources and whatnot, um, that black soil jumped out to them because at the time of, of the colonial period, uh, agriculture was the big business that everyone wanted to get into. And so everything was about land and farming and crops. Uh, not that it isn't still a major part of uh, the economy of the world, um, but it's not the mover and shaker that it used to be since, since the Industrial Revolution. We'll talk about that as we move forward in time. Um, so when it comes to weather, there's lots of things that are unique to our specific environment. Um, ways, well, weathering means just, just how things are kind of uh, deconstructed in a way, right? And so frost wedging is a good example, something that we would have more of in our climate than other climates. Frost wedging is just that, you know, when it's, when it's warm, you get rain and precipitation. As the season changes, um, that water can go in these, in these cracks, and when it freezes, uh, you know, expands slightly, and then when it thaws out, um, what that means is through time, these little cracks will get larger and larger, uh, and eventually this, this whole area would probably fall off. Um, now that freezing and thawing, although it's really hard on our roads, obviously, uh, it's been very good for what making our soils what they are by breaking down rocky components into smaller and smaller, finer uh, particles. Uh, our roads actually also have something called salt weathering slash wedging, which is, you know, if you're wondering why, why the roads fall apart so quick. Well, not only do we go through these freezing and thawing cycles where the water itself gets in cracks, and when it freezes, it expands those cracks, and so it builds up through time, just tears away the roads. The salt that we put on the roads ourselves also get in those same cracks, and also can expand and then contract. Um, so the salt itself is doing a fair amount of, of damage that we don't think about. Um, later in this book, we'll also talk about the accumulation of the salt that we're putting on our roads uh, growing in our lakes increasing the the salinity of our lakes through time. Uh, something that people kind of really didn't think would ever be that much of a problem, but it's starting to have a noticeable impact on somebody's water, especially if they're central to the cities, have a lot of roads surrounding them. Uh, limestone, limestone, um, as you can see, there's limestone deposits kind of all over the place, um, but there's a fair amount locally here. Uh, limestone in general uh, tends to have more caves uh, because it can be kind of weathered away by underground water pretty easily. Uh, so that's one of the reasons why we have things like the Wabashaw Caves, if you've ever been to do a tour over there. Um, we don't have quite the caves that other places do, but we do have limestone. Um, they make caves, but they also, because limestone tends to uh, get weathered away underground, you could have sometimes uh, the land sink uh, because that's been taken away. <clears throat> this is a limestone cave. Um, anyone ever done any cave in Minnesota? Visit any of the local caves we have? Eagle Cave. Eagle Cave. <laughs> same. Yeah. I think this is actually Wisconsin, but Crystal Cave. Yeah, same. Actually, I think there's like three caves that are called Crystal Cave. Uh, they should they should get a team together and decide which ones are the real Crystal Caves. Did you have your hand up? No. Um, yeah, I would say if you ever do want to go visit caves, um, visit some in the Dakotas especially. Uh, I know the ones in like Colorado are kind of more famous, 
But because they're more famous, they've had people going in and just like destroying them for a long period of time before there was any real kind of laws and regulations. Now you go in and usually there's a fence and they have people watching you and saying, don't destroy this natural wonder. Uh, but they didn't used to do that back in the day. So you gotta go to caves that have been less used. Wind Cave, I believe, has the world's largest collection of boxwork formation in uh, South Dakota. That sounds right. That sounds right. Um, all right, where's it going? Oh yeah. Um, so, you know, these chapters talk a fair amount about how our lakes form. Um, a number of our lakes that we have, our book talks about, uh, formed in an unusual way because they're rivers that kind of cut themselves off and then they, they became lakes later. Uh, and what does that mean? Well, I mentioned before how moving water has kinetic energy, right? And it picks up stuff and fast moving water can pick up more. And when that water slows down, it drops that stuff because it doesn't have the energy anymore. And so what you'll have is you'll have an area where, you know, mountains are being eroded and it's carrying a fair amount of, of stuff in it, but it might hit a bend or something. And when it does, it slows down. So it will drop off that stuff. And sometimes you'll have the case where it will just completely block itself. Uh, so you'll have like a stranded, uh, a stranded river uh, that just becomes um, a lake due time. We have a fair number of those compared to other places. Um, this book was also talking about uh, during the glacial period, um, areas that were the meltwater of, of glaciers. Um, this, as you can see, this, this, this lake, and I forget how those are pronounced actually, but uh, this is specifically mentioned in our textbook uh, as a meltwater because, because this was a meltwater of a glacier, and glaciers tend to have lots of bits of debris and stuff, and so because this was a lake, it had all these kind of fine particles being put down through time, uh, that managed to give it uh, very good soil. It's very good soil. So when we eventually get to more of the farming and whatnot, we'll see that this area here um, has been kind of the, the center of a lot of the farming that's been done in our region. Um, and it's also just one of those things where when we picture glaciers, we'll picture them kind of coming from the north and then receding, and that happens some but there was more kind of sideways and sometimes a glacier would be stuck because let's say it's melting, uh, but of course it takes years and years for a glacier to melt. And the melt water is going this way uh, and it kind of blocks itself a bit. Um, so you'll have kind of little islands of glaciers uh, that took longer to melt than others. Um, this book also very briefly talks about uh, different ores um, I would say there's whole ch more chapters toward the end that go into great, great more detail, but I thought I would just throw this picture up real quick, showing some of the classic iron range areas that we're going to be talking about quite a bit. Um, more kind of this range, I'll talk about this range to NMO2, um, but as you can see, when we talk about the iron range and whatnot, uh, we're talking about areas that are pretty far north uh, in general. Um, so let's say staying on the topic of glaciers, uh, you know, they're, they're tough to conceptualize. Oh yeah. Uh, with the iron ranges, what's the inactive active refers to? Oh, there, I mean, it's, it, it's, it's kind of what it sounds like. There's, there's, um, uh, a, a lot of them have been kind of mined out, uh, and, and once a mine has kind of gone through all the easy to get to stuff, then you need a real price increase to make it worthwhile to go and dig even deeper to get more. Um, and I would say that there's, there's, in areas that are inactive, there's pockets of activity that it's still, uh, and it really depends on the, the price. If prices, as you know, like inflation has been in the news, right? And so, well, if pl prices of these ores have gone up with inflation, then it might be economically feasible to, to make them active again, you know? <clears throat> um, 
So back into talking about glaciers a bit more. These are obviously not Minnesota glaciers. These are just mm -hmm. glacier pictures I found elsewhere. Um, but glaciers, when they have come out and, and came over Minnesota, um, you got to picture them as kind of more of a, a plastic kind of a thing. Uh, because through time and through the weight, you can see how much darker blue this is than here. The darker blue the snow is, the less air it has in it, and that's a good indication of how long it's been pressed down and compressed. And so it is the most compressed ice, right, that is pushing out. So glaciers grow in a very weird way in that they have snow falling on the top, and this pressure brings, you know, if you picture this pressure coming down, so it squishes the glacier out. So when the glaciers are spreading across the Earth's surface, they're actually grinding out and they, um, well, some areas that you could go that used to be glaciers, um, there's nothing but bedrock because it's been totally, totally smoothed over. Um, and some areas, sometimes you'll have uh, bodies of water that when the glacier came through, if there was weak soil in that area, it just dug the whole thing out. <clears throat> um, again, these are glaciers that aren't from here, but they're just to give you a visual of, you have snow coming down and it pushes it out, right? Um, as you can see in these examples too, as they get pushed out, they carry parts of land masses with them, that's why they have these dark stripes, is they're grinding, grinding away. And so glaciers bring soils with them too. Um, and in the book it talks a lot about the different stuff that is left over after the glaciers recede, um, usually bodies of water, usually rivers and things like that, uh, but also big flat areas that have been curved out. <clears throat> So for example, this glacier, right? We had a glacier kind of slowly moving in and as it's going, it's just crushing the ground and kind of dragging it with. Um, and so we'll find these landscapes in places in Minnesota um, that, are, that came about because of, of glaciers. Um, sometimes there'll be landforms that look like this because they've had everything kind of carved out so there's not a lot for plants and animals to kind of subsist on. Typically you could see the direction glaciers went because if there's a rock or whatnot and it drags it, it will just make a great big line grooves and indentations. Uh, there's lots of terms that are thrown around in this chapter. Glacial moraines, glacial till, a glacial fluvial deposits, glacial outwatch. What is all that stuff? That is just all the rocks and debris that glaciers shove into an area that when the glaciers then recede, they just kind of leave all that stuff. Um, and that includes small, small bodies of water that, that um, as you can see from the gray color, are bringing deposits even further down than the glacier is but that were all brought up from with the glacier. Uh, these are pictures I took, uh, or actually no, I don't remember if I took this or not, but this is from Alaska. Just to give examples of when the glacier recedes, like all the stuff that is pushed from the mountains is just kind of left there. Um, and this is just a good example of the runoff at the end of a glacier, right? Glaciers, uh, people don't picture them being kind of like so dirty and full of full of other materials, uh, but they are, and they bring all that to, to new, new places. Um, and I know it might be confusing because the book will use terms, like they'll talk about Wisconsin terminal moraines. Terminal moraines are just all the stuff that's left at the end of a glacier. And so although it's a Wisconsin uh, terminal moraine, that's because that glacier was from Wisconsin, it exists in modern day Minnesota. So I thought I'd just explain that one for if it, it gets confusing, the wording in the book.
Uh, let's see. Um, so again, some specific things that our book, our book talks about these specific different features, drumlins, um, and it's like, well, what is all this stuff? Well, um, you have a number of different things happening, right? When the glaciers are at a larger extent, you'll have a big um, marginal lake, right? This is an area that usually, if that empties out of water, that could be a real good place for growing crops, or it might just remain water and it will just be a modern day lake. Um, there's also, in these glaciers, you'll have these crevasses, right? You have cracks, because if it's going over uneven ground, right, and so it'll, it'll crack. Well, those are also where you'll have some melt and they'll go through the cracks. And when they do that, they'll bring little bits of deposits and whatnot with them. And so after the glaciers have retreated, you'll have these little bumps and things that are just where drainage from the glaciers. Um, and in, in this example, you have ice blocks as well. Ice blocks are part of the reason why we have so many lakes uh, is because, well, when they, they, met, they melt, they become kettle lakes. Uh, usually you could tell if you're at a lake, you could tell if it's a kettle lake if um, it gets deep super quick. If it gets deep super quick. There's a good picture. Because um, if they're, they're glacial lakes, uh, you'll have these ice that, that, that expanded. Um, and because they weren't made with any kind of process that would create a beach or whatnot, sometimes in Minnesota, they'll just put in fake beaches with some mm -hmm. sand. But like I said, if you're at a lake and it gets deep super fast, that's a good example of it being a kettle lake. Uh, these are end moraine deposits. Again, this is just what's left over uh, when the glacier retreats. All the stuff that the glacier was kind of dragging with it, it just, just like it drops it, right? Uh, another good example of a glacial lake. Um, this is a, a drumlin. Oh, it's not a great picture. Actually, this projector isn't super great. Um, Esker, uh, again, this is, this is when you have uh, crevasses in a glacier and they have the water coming down and it's bringing stuff with it. Um, these things are kind of, you know, give what is an otherwise a pretty flat state, some hills every now and then. Uh, Finger Lakes. These are when uh, glaciers are coming through and they scoop up the, the underlying material. Uh, and so then when they recede, when they melt, uh, you have these, these longish things that are left. Um, this picture set, set shows that, you know, in general, all the glaciers where they were placed and how they receded. I would say this actually makes it seem a lot more uh, like it was a steady process. Because what happened with the glaciers is the glaciers would increase slightly and then decrease, and then you'd have weather where they would unevenly increase and decrease. And so you would have um, over thousands of years, you would have glaciers come in and go and come in and go and come in and go. So these pictures can kind of make it seem like it was just big one big glaciation that all then just left, but it was more more like weather, more like weather, uh, and that they would recede and and come back over and over. Um, oh, and this is when I was talking about that I had a better picture uh, of St. Anthony Falls. Um, like I said, the book talks about this about how falls are weathered and and this was a measurable amount that these would recede um and so there was actually warnings and whatnot before there was the big uh catastrophe when you had a big cave in uh mixed with a whole bunch of kind of rickety infrastructure that was around um and that's when the twin cities changed up and decided to make the whole thing permanent concrete <clears throat> uh, our book talks a fair amount, uh, kind of surprisingly, about wind power. Uh, I think it was kind of, maybe it was just a bit in vogue when this was published. Not that wind power isn't a good thing, and it is a good and expanding thing, 
The book talks about how, in general, you have some areas of the state that have higher winds on average, and so they tend to have a bit more wind energy potential. Um, I included this map just showing, um, well, if you have wind, wind over something that doesn't have trees or mountains to slow it down, it can be quicker, so over the Great Lakes. Uh, I've always kind of thought, well, I wonder if they would put a wind facility out here because it's far enough out that you wouldn't see it from, from the shore. Uh, all right. Well, now I mentioned to you before that we're going to do work in class. Work in class. Now, we haven't done it yet, so I'll explain it to you. It's pretty simple. So these are some questions that are similar to questions we have on our quizzes. Um, and what I do is um, I'll have you get into groups uh, and have these different sizes, different days. But what you'll do is you'll have one piece of paper. All of your names will be on it. And you just write down chapter one, two, three, four, five. And you as a team determine if these are true or false. And then when you're done with it, you bring it on up here and I'll grade it. Um, and then that's usually, it's usually pretty simple. Uh, let's see, I think I will have you get in groups in size of between like two to four people per group, two to four people per group. So if you're off an island, find, find someone to work with. Um, but these are just due before the end of class. Do we, are we allowed to look them up in our books? Yes, you okay. can use your books. That's why I encourage you to bring your books. Oh, how dare. Look, that's one of the two of us. Yeah. No, that's good. So that would be, yeah, so the north, south of the state has a longer growing season. Just by looking at the part of the state. I'm going to tell you that. Just oh, it has the, just based on the frost, first yelling frost doesn't happen usually until September 30th, October, October 5th. So that's the average growing season of the north third. Oh wait, that is the average of the north third, and well, this is the south third. So the south has longer slats. Yeah. Well, I could just tell you just looking at that too. You can't grow things if there's frost. You can't. I know this from experience. I think so because. Yeah. Because. Um, yeah. Particles, yeah. particles yeah. in the air that cause was the accumulate on the yeah. water yeah. vapor accumulates on the particles in the air causing um, wind snowfall yeah. is yeah. highest yeah. in that yeah. 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 And it's remember the, the wind is yeah. like right around here. Yeah. That's about sixty. Yeah, making a map. 
I want to say no. Yeah. Here's a mean average annual snowfall. I'm going to say that's false because there's a lot of places that have yeah, fire. Duluth is right about here. Yes. 